tonight I want you to grab your Bible and we're gonna spend a few moments in Proverbs. We're gonna spend a few moments in the middle of your Bible, the book of Proverbs, and looking at our plans and God's purpose. Our plans and God's purpose. And here's what I know, that as I look across this room and certainly true across the campuses, across the church, you know, across those who are watching online, the reality is that we're always facing different intersections, different really major intersections in life. That's the way that life works, that you kind of go from one intersection to the next. And so it goes from, you know, should I, should I date this person? Should I be in a relationship with this person? To should I marry him? Uh, to, you know, hey, you know, should I move out of my parents' house where it's cheap and get a job and uh, pay my own bills and get my own place to live? If he's asking that question, then the first question kind of answered itself. Um, so the answer would be no. Um, he's not ready. But should I get out or should I, should I go back to graduate school or should I continue in the course of, you know, work that I'm already in and the career path that I'm on? You know, should I, should, should we start our own business? You know, is it time? You know, is it this? Is this God? Like, is He in this? You know, should we go that direction? Is that what God has for us? You know, should we move or should we follow? You know, family out this direction or should we? Is it time to retire? Or should I keep working? All of those represent major intersections in the life of a person or a family. And so, some people in this room, you are right now in the midst of planning because you're at an intersection, and so you're thinking about a plan. There are other people in the room and you're in a conversation. You've beyond, you're beyond thinking and now you're like, you're talking about it. You're discussing it. You're mulling it over. Some of you are beginning to lay the groundwork for a plan. And so you're, you, you've discussed it and you've thought about it and now you're doing it. Some of you are looking at your plan and you're just confused. You know, like I said, I don't know what to do with this. I had a plan. Or you're watching your plan kind of shift. And so you're like, well, that was, that's kind of interesting. When you go to the book of Proverbs, I'm, what I'm so thankful for is that not only that, you know, the recognition that plans are part of life, but that God has given us a book in his word that talks a lot about plans. And that's the book of Proverbs. In fact, when you go to Proverbs chapter 16, we're going to look at just a few verses at the beginning of the chapter before we then come back and pray a bit more. What the writer of Proverbs does is he gives us, he answers four questions in just a few short verses that help give some clarity to this whole issue of what we do and how we process our plans. And so Proverbs chapter 16, verse one, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, for its purpose. So four questions that the writer of Proverbs answers in these verses about plans. And the first question is, who do your plans belong to? Who do your plans belong to? That's where we got to start. So go back to verse one. The plans of the heart belong to a man but the Lord answer, that the answer is for, uh, for the tongue is from the Lord. Now, here's the reason why I even stumbled while I was reading that. Because when I read this verse, I came across this verse in my devotions not too long ago. I was reading my Bible. And honestly, my mind read it backwards. I read, the plans of the heart belong to the Lord. And the answer of the tongue is from a man. And I had to go back and go, wait, wait a second, that's not right. I, I, I did, and so I started thinking about this whole issue of plans. Okay, okay, so the writer of Proverbs says, the plans of the heart belong to a man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So who do plans belong to? Who do, who do your plans belong to? And as I looked at the verse and as I looked at what the writer of Proverbs says to the rest of the passage, it became apparent that the answer, that there are actually two answers, two right answers. And it's not a trick question. That the writer of Proverbs gives us two answers. First and foremost, that your plans are your plans and your plans do belong to you. The writer of Proverbs says the plans of the heart belong to man. In other words, your plans are really your plans. 
your plans, the things that you're, you're navigating, the things that you're looking forward to, the things that you're pursuing, things that I'm pursuing, the things that Becky and I are talking about, those are really our plans. That there's a, there's a level of ownership in those. There's a level, like we thought about it. They're not some, there's not some thing that God is doing that kind of co-ops the process of us working through or navigating that inter, whatever intersection we're at in life. They, they are legitimately our plans. And the plans, that, that word for plan is actually the word preparation. So it's used of an army going into battle. That the army is preparing, not only preparing for, for battle, but then bat, that preparation is accompanied by action. So this word plan is actually, you could think of it in terms of preparation. This is not an impulse. This is not you at 2.30 in the afternoon driving past Chick-fil-A and kind of going, huh, and then ending up in the drive through line and being like, well, how did I get here? Well, I think a sweet tea and a large fry sound good. You know, that's not what we're talking about. That's what the writer of Proverbs is talking about. Although I'm sure if the writer of Proverbs lived today, he would go to Chick-fil-A. Um, but that's beside the point. That's not where we're at. This is not an impulse move. This is preparation. This is a plan. And the writer of Proverbs says these are definite plans accompanied by action. And they're plans that belong to us. But they don't only belong to us. Which is why the writer of Proverbs goes where he does in the second part of the verse. He says, oh, actually, I... Ooh, go back. Yeah, there you go. The answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What the writer of Proverbs is talking about there is the action element. In other words, you, there's a planning, there's internal planning, and then there's what that plan produces. So one commentator, which I, I think this is really helpful, one commentator says, it's important for us to see the necessity and the limitations of planning. That the creature gets the first word, but the creator gets the last word. Yeah. That's really good. That means there's two sides. Who, who do the plans belong to? Two right answers. They belong to you and they belong to God. And then I love how Eugene Peterson, because he gives some clarity to this in the message paraphrase. He says, mortals make elaborate plans, but God has the last word. So when we ask the first question, who do your plans belong to? When you begin to ask that question, the answer is twofold. The plans belong to me, plans belong to God. That God is sovereignly working in my life and he's bringing me not only to a place where I find an intersection, where a decision needs to be made, where a plan needs to be formulated, but he is also bringing whatever that plan is, he's the one who's going to animate it and bring it into being. He gets the last word. Now, second question, because this is really helpful. And I think it's also good for you to think about this a little bit before we even dive into what does God see in your plans? Because when you talk about who the plans belong to, the, the writer of Proverbs uses the word for God he uses is the, you know, you'll see capital L-O-R-D, Lord, is the name for God he uses, which you know if you're a student of your Bible that, the Lord, that when you see that, Yahweh is the name for God, that is the Hebrew name for God that's being used. It's a personal name for God. We talked about this last week. The, the difference would be like with the name Elohim. It's more of a general name for God or designation for God. Yahweh is a personal designation for God. What the writer of Proverbs is indicating there is that God is personally involved in the details of our lives. God's interested in the minutia of your life. That every little detail, every little element, every little part, and every little quadrant of your life, God wants to work in that. And God is working in that, which it should be, that's really encouraging. God is at work in your life. Now, what does God see in your plans? So your plans belong to you. Your plans belong to God. But what does God see in them? Go to, go to verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. All, all the ways, your plans, you look at them, the way that you're walking through life, the way that you see your trajectory, all of those things, you know, it's pure in your own eyes, but the Lord weighs the Spirit. So underneath the surface of what's going on in your life, what's going on 
in your actions, God's the one who's able to see underneath that. God can peer below what everybody else can see, and he can watch what's going on. So underneath what we're planning, how we're preparing, God looks at it. God sees it. Now, when the writer of Proverbs says the Lord weighs the spirit, what he's literally talking about is the motive. God sees the motive. God sees what's moving you along, what's pushing that decision forward. You know, we're thinking about the what, God's thinking about the why. We tend to process through the what, God processes through the why. God sees the why. But we can have, I mean, a tendency to reverse engineer our planning around the what. And we reverse engineer the why. So, we, how does this work? I'll give you a perfect example. You're on a diet. You're trying to eat healthy. You're being really, you know, you're being really good. You're three days in. What happens? Somebody brings an ice cream cake to the office. It's like, well, are you going to have any ice cream cake? Yeah, I, I think I will. I think I will. The ice cream cake is the what? Now you got to figure out the why. Because you weren't supposed to. The why, if it was the other way around, the answer to the what would be what? No. Oh, thank you. I'm really happy birthday, but can't do that. You know, just can't. But you already, what? The what is driving it. The what is, I'm hungry for ice cream cake. Now i got to figure out the rationale for me eating ice cream cake. I worked really hard this morning. I ate a light lunch. I'm going to burn a lot of calories in my cubicle. Yes, I'll have ice cream cake. That's reverse engineering the what. So now it's like, okay, I've, I have to figure out the why on the back end. God doesn't do that. So we're doing that. We're often thinking that way, and that's called justification, self-justifying or justifying cake. That's, that's what that is. God sees below the external justifications. God looks below that to the motive behind the plan, the motive underneath the plan, if you will. God sees that. Uh, you know, and so when the writer of Scripture is talking about this, you know, here, here once again, Eugene Peterson nails it in his translation. What does he say in verse 2? Humans are satisfied with whatever looks good. God probes for what is good. In other words, it's not just we can tend to think, okay, God, what does God see in your planning? Ooh, God sees your motives. Ooh, God's out, you know, he knows. Sometimes our motives are wrong. Sometimes our motives are impure. And God, yeah, God sees that. Yeah, God looks underneath the plan. God knows the, God knows the heart. God knows you at the core of who you are. God knows that you're reverse engineering in order to get that thing that you want. God knows that. He sees that. But I think it's, it's not only that God sees the motive, God also sees your future. God sees where the plan goes in a way that we can plan, but we don't know the future. We can hypothesize about where this plan will lead us and what it'll do in our family and what it'll do in my life and the, all the good things that will happen. But humans are satisfied with whatever looks good. God probes for what is good. In other words, you don't have to be concerned about God looking under the surface of your planning because what is God after? He's after your good. He's after your good. And sometimes when we're in the midst of the planning phase or we're at an intersection, we can be scared to submit our plan to God because we're afraid that he's going to somehow veto it and make us really, really unhappy. Oh, I don't, I don't, if I, if I ask God what he thinks about this, I don't think he's going to like it and I won't like that. So I'm not going to ask him. <laughs> That's how we do that. What does Jeremiah 29, 11 say? It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God is about doing good for you in your future. Who can see the future, you or God? That's an easy one. God, 
You're like, if some of you can see the future, we need to talk after church. God is the one who sees the future and he's after your good. I love what Tim Keller says because this is so, 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 so helpful. God always does for you what you would do for you if you knew what he knows. Sometimes we forget that he knows more than us. Therefore, his plan is going to be better than our plan because he sees underneath the surface. He sees our motives. He knows us, but he also lives outside of time, so he sees the future. He knows the end from the beginning simultaneously. So what does God, who do your plans belong to? Well, they belong to you and God, but what does God see? Remember, God sees more than you see. That's the short answer. Now, the third question, what do you need to do with your plans? What do you need to do with your plans? This is a good, good question to ask. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where it gets really practical. What do you need to do with your plans? Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So we need to commit our plans to the Lord and our work will be established. No, that's not what he says. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. This is another tricky one for me. For whatever reason, I have this memorized backwards. That I have it committing that what I need to do with my plans is I need to commit my plans to the Lord and then he will establish my work. He'll see that that plan is done because I committed that plan to the Lord and now it's as good as gold. That's the way I process that verse. But what do I need to do with my plan? He doesn't say commit your plan to the Lord. He says commit your work to the Lord. Now that word work, you could say it's this, commit your activity to the Lord, commit your actions to the Lord. One commentator says commit yourself to the Lord. But we start talking about activity, actions, and work, that kind of, if you roll that all up, where are you going? your life. Commit, or you could put it this way, commit today to the Lord. Commit your today to the Lord. Because a lot of times it is easier for us to commit our plans to the Lord because our plans are way out there. They're on the horizon. Oh yeah, God will, that, I'm committing that way over there to God. What about today? Well, you know, you know, we, we would say they're committed to the Lord. Your day is committed to the Lord. But that word commit, it means to lay on top of or to place all your weight on. So, but a lot of us, when we think of, when, our, when we look at our life, now, now the plans, the ones way out there, oh yeah, those are all, those are all with God. Well, what about today? Well, I'm, I'm very, I'm putting all my weight on the Lord. Just, what are you doing? I'm changing a light bulb, you know. Well, why do you have that ladder? Well, it's, it's holding me up. No, it's not. No, it's, it's totally not. You're holding yourself up. No, I've got this ladder here. Very committed. Safety. Committed to safety. No, you're not. It doesn't make any sense. But a lot of times, this is the way that we're handling today. And when somebody walks by and says, oh, so are you, you're committing your plans to the Lord? Yes, absolutely. Totally committed to God. I, my whole life is actually on him. Totally committed to him. But here's the problem. When there's no commitment for today, there's no establishment of tomorrow. Or when there's mediocre commitment of today or half-hearted commitment today or equal weight on you and God today, there's no establishment of tomorrow because God's promise is not if you half-heartedly commit your plans to, or your work to me today, I will fully establish your plans tomorrow. That's not what God says. He says if you commit your work to me, I will establish your tomorrow. If you commit your day to me, I will establish your tomorrow. But commitment is you putting all your weight, all the weight of your work, all the weight of what you're doing today, everything is on him. So guess what? If he fails, you fall. But a lot of us are going, well, if he fails, I'll be okay. God says, no, 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 no. 
No backup plans. No backup plans. Everything right here. Oh, on the my plans can be no, 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 no. Now your plans are contingent on today being right here. And when you commit your day today to the Lord, He will establish your tomorrow. That's what God wants to do in your life. So what do I do with my plans? Well, you set your plans into motion by honoring God with what he's put in front of you right now. So I, wh wh where are you at right now? What are you, what are you doing right now? Well, I've got a plan. I've, I'm going to go places. I'm going to do things for Jesus. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have a Fortune 500 company. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a vice president locally. Are you, no, no, no. I'm not talking about, no, 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 no. What are you doing today? Yeah. Well, no, what are you doing right now with what God has put in your hand right now? Because the Bible says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Yeah. So that's the third question we have to answer. What are you doing with your plans? Well, I'm just taking care of what God's put in front of me today. That's what I'm doing with my plans. And I'm letting God establish what's on the horizon. Now, the writer of Proverbs, question number four, and with this, the team can come up. What does God do through our plans? What does God do through our plans? Look at this in verse four. The Lord has made everything for its purpose. The Lord has made everything for its purpose. Some of you are in a season right now and there's a lot of confusion because you have been walking out a plan and things haven't turned out the way that you wanted them to or thought they would. Or maybe you're in a situation where you're really, really discouraged because you don't know which way to go. You're in an intersection and you're dumbfounded by, is it a right turn? Is it a left turn? Is it straight? I don't, I'm kind of at a loss right now. And in those seasons, either where the plan isn't working out and things haven't turned out like you thought they would or things are in the process of not turning out and it doesn't seem like things are coming together or you feel like, ah, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I've, I've kind of taken, I mean, I kind of walked this way and then this way and then I'm just lost. And I'm not sure what direction to go. What do you have to remember in those seasons? What does the writer of Proverbs say you have to remember and that I have to remember? The Lord has made everything for its purpose. How many things has the Lord made for its purpose? Everything. Meaning the situation you're in that you don't understand, it hasn't turned out the way that you wanted it to, that you don't know where it's going, you don't know where it's leading. What did he do with that? Well, he made it for a purpose. It's serving his purpose. That is not an accident. What you're going through, you need to hear this tonight. What you're going through is not an accident. You say, but it's painful. God never wastes your pain. Say, but I'm a little bit confused. Trust him. Lean on him. Look to him. He's working all things together for his purpose. Everything, everything. God has made everything for a purpose. Today has a purpose. What you walked through yesterday has a purpose. What you walked through last month has a purpose. You're saying, but what I walked through last month got me where I am today. God can work all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. He's at work. He's at work. You, you might say, well, I'm on, the, you know, I'm on the front end of this thing. Like, I'm just coming. I'm just getting to that intersection. I'm just beginning. I'm in the thought process about a plan. I'm in the conversation process about a plan. What do you need to remember? You need to remember that in your processing and in your thinking and in your conversations, God has made everything for its purpose. That God has a purpose in what you're walking through. He has a purpose in what you're planning. He has a purpose in what you're talking about. He has a purpose in what you're thinking about. You were created on purpose, for a purpose, to fulfill a purpose. And every single day, every single day, 
plays into that. Every single decision plays into that. Every single processing of every single plan plays into that. It's all on purpose. So what do I have to do? What do you have to do? Tonight, what do you need to do? Here's what you gotta do. You gotta go back to verse three. What I can do today and what you can do today, I can't see the future. I can't work the plan tonight. All I can do and all you can do to to see the plan established in the future is do what? Commit our work to the Lord. Is this a picture of your life? Is this a picture of your marriage? Is this a picture of your career? Is this a picture of whatever you find in your hand today? It's all on him. So that if he fails, which he won't, that's the good news, you would fail. Your job and my job tonight, in God's presence, regardless of the plan we're working, the plan we're considering, the plan we're in the middle of, regardless of where you find yourself, whether it's confusing or clear, if you say, you know what? I want God to establish my plan and his plan for my life, then what I have to do is to commit today to him in every way, in every sphere, in every quadrant, every aspect of my life, every aspect of my heart, fully surrendered, fully committed to him.